to the website after we're done. Uh, if you have any questions, you can simply type in the chat button or you can unmute yourself, politely interrupt and ask your question. Perfectly fine. Reasonable? Okay. So uh, tonight I wanted to uh, review with you the forms of business and uh, the uses of accounting information so you can get a head start on your reading uh, and homework for next week. Let's say you wanted to start a business. Uh, you actually have three different forms of business that you can legally choose from, okay? Uh, so you can choose to be a sole proprietorship, and a sole proprietorship is a business that's owned by one person, and okay, that's, that's where the sole comes from. Um, you could organize into a partnership. Partnerships are businesses that have two or more owners, owners. Um, or you can organize into a corporation, which I'll be getting into uh, in just a moment. Let's go back to our sole proprietorship. So these are the three forms of business. So if you wanted to be a sole proprietor, it's actually the easiest form of business to start. Uh, for example, if I wanted to, um, Let's say I was talking with you guys tonight and I said, you know, this teaching gig is pretty good, but what I really want to do is clean houses or walk dogs um, and be a dog walker. Uh, well, that's something I could start right away. I mean, I don't need a particular license or certification to be a dog walker. I don't need a license or certification to clean houses. Um, and so literally speaking, I could start a business uh, as soon as I said, this is what I want to do, and I'll start doing it. It gets a little bit more complicated if there are regulations that are in place. So for example, I couldn't be a barber. I couldn't say I'm going to open up, uh, I'm going to start cutting hair. Because uh, barbers need to be licensed. There's a state licensure uh, process. So in order for me to actually even open up a barbershop, I have to be licensed first to be a barber before I can open up my barbershop. Uh, the same is true with things like cosmetology, uh, massage therapy, daycare. Uh, there are licenses that are needed um, before you can open up uh, your particular business. But as such, it's still a relatively simple form of business to start. Um, it doesn't require really much of anything outside of appropriate licenses and permits. Um, to get started. And again, if I wanted to walk dogs starting tomorrow, I can do that. You know, I, I don't need a special license to do that. And boom, I'm in business. Uh, because I'm the only owner, I control everything. I'm the owner and the manager. Um, it's whatever, whatever I decide. Uh, my hours is whatever I decide. Um, you know, everything that I just do is basically whatever I decide because I'm the boss. Um, I own it. Uh, the wonderful thing about being the only owner is if it's a profitable business, it's all mine. The profits of a business is, belongs to the owner. So if I'm the only owner uh, and I make a profit, it's all mine. Okay. Uh, better yet, uh, that profit is going to be looked at as my personal income. Because under the law, there's no difference between me, the person, say Mike the dog walker, and me the business, Mike the dog walker. There's no difference under the law between the two. So that means whatever I earn from my business is personal income. And thus I can put it down on my personal income taxes and those tax rates start at 10% and go up from there. Okay, and that's an advantage. And it's an advantage because if I were a corporation and I made a profit, the tax rates for corporations begin at 21% and go up from there. So the tax advantage is a lower tax rate. Of course, it's not all, you know, beautiful being a sole proprietor. Um, there are some limitations. If I need money to start my business, it's totally up to me to get it because I'm the only owner. And so whatever I have for credit, whatever I have for savings, 
whatever I have for assets I can use. But if I'm limited in that way, I'm going to be limited in the amount of money I can raise. Um, also, what's true is if the business loses money, I'm the owner. So if I gain when it profits, I also have to, I'm responsible when it loses. And so if it loses money, it's up to me to decide whether I want to keep going or not. If I want to keep going, I'll cover the loss, put more money in the business and keep going. Uh, if not, I can decide, oh, I'm done. You know, I try. Um, so it's not all uh, fun and games. It's great when it works well. It's not so great when it doesn't because you're all, you are the only owner and the owners are responsible for everything. One other issue as well um, that's very important is because you are uh, the, the owner of the business and there's no difference between you, the owner, and you, the person, if you get sued from a business perspective, everything you own is up for grabs. It doesn't, it's not restricted to business stuff. So you might have an office, office furniture, other types of things, and you have your home and your car. It's not like the law looks at it as separate. You know, it's not like, oh, well, this happened in, in a business uh, thing. Um, and so you don't have to worry about anything. Everything is up for grabs because legally there's no difference between you, the person, and you, the business, and a sole proprietorship. So we call that liability. And so there's really what we call unlimited liability in the case of uh, anything going wrong, you're solely responsible and uh, literally that could be costly in a worst case scenario. Um, and so that's something to think about. Partnerships are also relatively easy to establish. Okay, they're relatively easy to establish as well. Um, very much like a sole proprietorship, you can be together with, uh, with a buddy and say, you know, tomorrow let's just start cleaning houses. Um, and, and that's that. And start a business together. And you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, again, it gets tricky if there's licenses needed, if you're going to be cosmetology, whether you need licenses and so forth. Uh, so it, it kind of depends. But it really is that simple to establish. Uh, one of the good things about a partnership is that you're not alone. And so you have two or more people. So a partnership can be two or more people. So it'd be two people, three people, four people, 24 people, 204 people. It doesn't really matter. There's not a limit on the number of partners you can have uh, in a partnership, uh, but it's two or more people. And most, when we talk about partnerships here, we're talking about general partnerships, which basically uh, these are the people who are the owners and the active managers. Uh, there are other partners called limited partners. They're just investors. They're, they invest money in the partnership for a stake of ownership, but they don't run anything. They don't run anything. They're not actively managing anything. But as a sole proprietor, you're the owner and the manager. In a general partnership, you're the owner and you're the manager. You're there, it's yours. Um, and so the wonderful thing about having more than one person, sort of going back to the two heads to better than one type of philosophy is you should have more resources because not only can you bring money and resources into the business, but now your partner or partners can also do that. And you also should have a broader skill set. Um, you know, you might be really good at selling things. Uh, maybe your partner is really good at the financial piece, et cetera. Um, those are really good working partnerships and, uh, and more skills and more resources are taken. But partnerships like sole proprietorships are looked upon as there's no difference between the partners and the person. And so very much like a sole proprietorship, uh, there's unlimited liability. So if, you're, if you or your partner uh, or partners do something wrong and you get sued, everybody is getting sued. <laughs> um, and so that's really a problem because all your personal assets are also up for grabs uh, as well. And, um, but uh, as an advantage is if you are profitable as a partnership, um, then you're taxed as an individual. And so very much like the sole proprietorship, these start at very low tax rates at 10% and go up from there. So there are certain tax advantages, although there's still a liability question. 
Um, corporations are a very different animal because uh, you have to actually apply to the state government to, um, to become a corporation. So there's an application to incorporate. Uh, you can incorporate in any of the 50 states. Business law is jurisdiction of the state government. So the states decide how you become, you, how you can become a corporation in each of these states. Most of them have the same type of rules and paperwork and so forth. Um, some states like Delaware have some favorable corporate laws. And so a lot of businesses uh, decide, a lot of people decide to incorporate in Delaware to take advantage of those favorable corporate laws. Um, so you can literally have a Poughkeepsie business and decide to incorporate in Delaware, perfectly fine. Uh, but a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people just incorporate with, the, with their um, state government in the state that they're in. And, uh, uh, and it's the state who um, sets the parameters as how you can become a corporation. Once the state actually approves your application, what that means is the state has created a new legal being in the law. Okay. So corporations are very similar to, say, artificial people <laughs> um, or artificial per persons. They are legal entities in and of themselves, regardless of who started them. And so because they, the corporation, is a legal entity, um, whoever started that particular corporation has what we call um, limited liability. No personal liability. So if you started a corporation, say I was the dog walker, I could be a sole proprietorship because I'm a, I do it by myself. I could also decide to incorporate in the state of New York, fill out the application and get approved as Mike the Dog Walker Inc. Uh, well, that means that Mike the Dog Walker Inc, the company itself is under the law, its own entity. And just because I'm Mike of Mike, the Dog Walker Inc., doesn't mean that I'm personally liable for stuff. The business is, but I personally am not. Um, and so that's what they mean by no personal liability or limited liability. The corporation is its own entity and thus has, own, has its own legal rights and responsibilities. I have a question. Yes, go right ahead. Um, so, for a, for a business, you need your EIN, like, which is like a separate from your own social security. So it's like a business, like. That's an um, employment identification number. Mm -hmm. Right, so wouldn't, would that be considered its own, like its own thing and would be considered, and it wouldn't be part of you? Or is it still the same thing? Um, well, it, it's, it's separate from the forms of business, so. Uh, if you are a sole proprietor, uh, you can have an EIN to, to do your work, um, and it's still part of you. Although your EIN should be, it's going to be your social security number in most cases if you're a sole proprietor. Um, if you are a corporation, then yeah, you'll need to um, get the, uh, a bunch of things. EIN is one of them, um, uh, and you're going to need to register uh, and have an account with uh, the state um, and the federal government tax agencies, so the IRS and the Department mm -hmm. of Revenue, because you're going to be collecting taxes and uh, sending them to either Washington or Albany. Um, you collect sales taxes, you collect payroll taxes, etc. Uh, and that's not your money, that's money that belongs to either the state or the federal government. And so you need to you need to have that identification number to work in, in that way, but it's it's not a it's not it's really not dependent on the type of form of business that you have, um, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to answer your question in short. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, but let's go back to the corporation. So here we mentioned that there's one owner for a sole proprietorship there's two or more owners in a partnership. And these are, uh, these are by name. When you form a corporation, 
the ownership is actually broken into shares of ownership. And those shares of ownership is what we refer to as stock. So uh, corporations have shares of ownership um, and whoever has those shares of ownership are the owners. So for example, I um, applied in New York State for to be a corporation, Mike the Dog Walker, Inc. The application in New York, the basic application says that a corporation has 200 shares of ownership in New York State. So that's the basic application if I applied. My company, Mike the Dog Walker Inc., would be broken into 200 shares of ownership. Now, because I'm the only owner and I'm the only one working there, I can just go ahead and um, put money into my business and assign those shares of ownership to me. And so I'll be the only stockholder or the only shareholder. Um, but the owners of corporations are called shareholders, shares of ownership, and the word stock is the same. Matter of fact, on the stock market, the only thing that's for sale on the stock market is shares of ownership in these corporations. And so um, that's, you know, that's what shares mean. Shares of ownership and stock mean the same. Stockholders and shareholders is the same. They're the same term, they're interchangeable. The wonderful thing about the corporate form of business is the ownership of the corporation and the management of the corporation is separate. Unlike a sole proprietorship, if I sell my sole proprietorship to another person, everything has changed. In a partnership, if I have a partnership of A and B and we decide to add a C, well, partnership A and B has just stopped existing, and now a new business, partnership A, B, C, has now formed. If we're gonna add another partner later on, partnership A, B, C has stopped existing, and now partnership A, B, C, D has formed. And so with ownership changes on the sole proprietorship and partnership level, everything changes. That's not true in the corporate form. In the corporate form, uh, ownership, shares of ownership can change without management uh, practices changing. So for example, uh, I think you've probably all been to McDonald's, whether you've regretted it or not, it's another story, um, but we probably have all been to a McDonald's at one point in time in your life. And McDonald's is a public corporation. In other words, they have shares of ownership traded every day on the New York Stock Exchange. And um, every day, millions of shares of McDonald's stock is traded. So in other words, they have different owners of their shares of stock trading every day. But yet, nothing happens at the local restaurant. It's still run the same way. Uh, because in a corporation, the ownership is separate from the management of the company. And so uh, whoever is the owners of the shares doesn't affect the management of the company. Uh, well, how can that be? They're owners, don't they have a say? Well, in a corporation, corporations uh, do have owners, stockholders, but they don't, uh, they elect a board of directors to run things for them. And the board of directors hires the management of the company and tells them, this is what we gotta do. And so the board of directors acts in, on the stockholders' behalf, on behalf of the owners of the corporation, to, to make the corporation profitable for the owners. And, uh, and that's the unique thing about the corporate form uh, of business is there's, uh, there are differences in uh, ownership and management on a big scale. I have a question here. Okay, yes, and actually that's, uh, that's a great question, Mike, uh, in terms of public or private. Yes, I'm gonna get to that. Um, uh, great, so let me, let me address Mike's question as well here as we go. So when you become a corporation, when you incorporate, um, 
those shares are pretty much only uh, given to you. So for example, you're probably wondering how uh, Jeff Bezos became you know, worth $2 billion, uh, $200 billion, how Bill Gates uh, somehow got to be worth 50 or $60 billion, how Zuckerberg is worth what he's worth, et cetera. Well, it's because that when these companies were starting out, uh, the ownership, the shares of ownership were private and they basically assigned those shares to them. Private, uh, a private corporation is when ownership is privately held by usually a small group of individuals. Probably the biggest company uh, that you know about uh, that's a private corporation is called Bose, B-O-S-E. Bose Corporation, of course, makes all types of great stereo and sound and other equipment like this. Um, they're in, usually Bose systems are in all the high-end model cars. Um, you'll see, if you ever watch the Super Bowl, um, all the coaches on the sideline have the Bose headsets on and so forth. Um, they make awesome stuff. And they're a multi, they are a global corporation. They're all over the world. Well, you and I will really never know what's going on at Bose because the shares of ownership at Bose are privately held by Dr. Bose. Well, it's the late Dr. Bose. He died two years ago. Uh, his family and associates. They're the only ones who own the stock of the company. So they're the only ones who know what's going on in the company. Okay. Um, Zuckerberg started uh, as... Bill Gates started Microsoft as a private corporation. Um, same thing with Jeff Bezos and Amazon, that was a private corporation. Uh, actually, uh, Zuckerberg didn't want Facebook to be anything other than a private corporation. Uh, but sometimes during the, um, during the course of, of their corporate lives, they need to raise a shitload of money. Uh, and so one of the ways you can raise that type of money is to something called go public. In other words, change your ownership from private ownership to public ownership and, uh, and become what we call a public corporation. So a public corporation basically is simply a corporation whose shares of ownership can be owned by the public. So any of us as members of the public, we can own Walmart. Well, simply because Walmart is a public corporation. Uh, we can own Microsoft. Microsoft's a public corporation. Uh, we can own NVIDIA. We can own Tesla. We can own any of those companies because they're public corporations. In a public corporation, anyone in the public can buy shares of ownership. In a private corporation, that does not exist. Okay, that's all privately done. Uh, oftentimes, it's a family affair. Um, sometimes, uh, private ownership is done through a private placement on Wall Street. But normally, these are very wealthy investors that are getting involved. Uh, so there's not a lot of them involved. But for you and I, for the sake of this book and the sake of this class, we're going to be looking at the corporation as a public corporation. And again, a public corporation simply means their shares of ownership can be owned by anybody in the public. When you become a public corporation, one huge thing changes. All your information needs to go public. The government through the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is part of the Treasury Department, um, decides, uh, well, has decided long ago, since FDR days when it started, that in order to maintain trust in the financial markets, the stock market, the bond market, et cetera, uh, information has to be public. If the public can buy and invest in a company, the information has to be public. Okay. And so uh, the public information that we're really concerned about in this class is the accounting information, the financial information. And so it's very important to understand that as we go through this book, after we learn the bookkeeping cycle, which can be done in a, any business, um, when we get deeper into this book, it's gonna be from a corporate perspective, um, corporate accounting, uh, and looking at the rules that they have to 
play by as public corporations. Okay. Uh, one quick note on this, and I think I, I did I answer your, your question, Mike? Uh, I think I tried to uh, on this one. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, all corporations start as, as private. So this is what happened. This is how Bill Gates uh, became worth, became a billionaire overnight, is Microsoft was a private corporation in which Bill Gates and company owned most of the shares of the business. They petitioned that you have to, you can have as many shares as you want. So you can have 2 million shares, 200 million shares, whatever you're willing to buy. I mean, it's basically you have to pay the state to uh, recognize the corporation has so many shares. Um, they go through the investment banking firms on Wall Street to raise money. That doesn't mean that they give their shares up, they keep their shares. What they've just done is basically now their shares have a, have a market. Their shares can actually be publicly sold. And because they're gonna be public companies, part of the regulations are who owns the company. If any of the uh, managers and own um, how many shares, that has to be disclosed. Has to be disclosed in the record. And so these public records are the reason why we know how much Bill Gates is worth, how much Jeff Bezos is worth, how much Zuckerberg is worth. We know that because it's all public information. We know how many shares of stock they own, and we know what the price of that, those shares are, so we can do easy calculations. Uh, that's almost impossible to do in a private corporation. And so uh, what we have going on today in this country for the last four years is something quite unique because we have an owner of a private corporation who has become a very public figure, President of the United States. Uh, the Trump Organization is a private corporation. It's a real estate corporation. Uh, it's here in corporate in New York. Um, and because it's a private corporation, the shares of ownership are owned by Mr. Trump and, and most members of the family. Um, and that's tradition, that's typical. There's nothing unusual about that. That's very typical of what happens in a private corporation. Um, the unusual thing is that he still owns the corporation. He's still uh, an owner. He has not diverse, uh, divested his shares. And so, and he's become the president. So I think the, the country has debated, since we do have a business person who has a private corporation in a very public office uh, in real estate, hotels, golf, et cetera, um, you know, should the public know, you know, the financial situation within the Trump organization? I think it's an excellent question. I'm very glad the country's having this debate. Uh, I don't have an answer because as a business person, as a financial person, traditionally, this is a non-controversial thing. Private corporations never share their data with the public. Um, however, this is the first time that this has happened. So I think it's a good debate to have. I don't have an answer. I just think that's what the country, that's part of the debate. That's a good debate to have. Um, and so that's, that's what's happening here. Okay, so in terms of the financial information or the accounting information that's uh, put together, uh, there are uh, lots of users of this accounting information. Um, people that are internal users are um, from inside the company. So you might say, look, you know, I'm gonna be in marketing. I don't even need to know about accounting. Guess what, yes you do. Or I'm gonna be management or the CEO of a company. I don't need to know mark. I don't need to know anything about accounting. Yes, you do. Everything is about numbers. The purpose of having accounting classes in any type of business uh, degree program is to educate everyone in the business area, regardless where they're going, about the importance of the financial information, the importance of the accounting data. And uh, this, is no, this is no different, right? Um, in this case, you're in class, you're in a class where you're going, um, you could be going on to doing bookkeeping, you could be going on to doing something in accounting. Uh, and there are lots of really good opportunities in the accounting field. Um, but a lot of people um, in business have, have trouble understanding this, but it's really important to know if you don't know the numbers, if you don't understand the numbers, uh, 
uh, it's going to be really kind of hard to make sense of everything. So financial information uh, is used by every department, marketing, management, human resources, obviously in finance, but if there was production, uh, retail, other types of um, areas, they would all be using financial information. And it's a very important thing to know. So for example, uh, I'm gonna get into detail uh, on marketing and management uh, with you because I think it's important. Why would someone in the marketing department really be need to know much about financial information? Well, because of the price, okay? The price of goods and services that companies uh, have for sale to customers turns into revenue for the business. And revenues is where, it's probably the most important thing uh, that you need to know about a company. Everything starts with revenue. Revenue is about selling your goods and services. And if you're selling your goods and services to customers, they have to have a price. Right? The price that you and I pay, think about the last place you went shopping. The prices that you paid for whatever you bought is the revenue for the company you bought it from. Okay? And so that's very important to know. You have to know what revenue is. It's a very important thing in accounting. Um, so the revenues are tied to the prices. In this case, the, this example gives you uh, Apple. Okay, Apple has decided on a very high-priced model. They have decided, look, uh, our cell phones are, they're $1,000 because they're worth $1,000. Okay, terrific. You have to convince everyone that you, they should pay $1,000 for a cell phone. Well, that's the job of marketing. Marketing is, um, has to support the price policies of the company and has to do the promotion. Um, and that's, that's, their, that's their main job. That's what they have to do. And so um, this is a very important because Apple has chose to have a high price model. Now for uh, you go into an Apple store and you buy a phone for $1,000. Well, that's the revenue for the company. That's the revenue for the company. The revenue is so important, so important, I'll tell you why. That revenue that the company just earned has to cover all of their costs. We call those costs expenses. And again, I, I'm writing this on a, <laughs> on a pad and I, I apologize. Um, our expenses, E-X-P-E-N, that's the answer we'll be reading about it anyway. So um, the revenues that the company collects have to cover all the expenses and there has to be revenue left over because the revenue that left that's left over is the profit of the company. And the profit in accounting is called the net income. Okay, profit in accounting is called the net income. Apologize for, I don't have one of those pen things I have to do with my finger. Um, so revenue is critical. So for example, uh, for every iPhone that Apple sells for $1,000, for example, um, believe it or not, $800 of that uh, $1,000 they've collected, 80% uh, of it covers the expenses uh, for Apple. So that's manufacturing expenses, selling and administrative expenses, et cetera. And about $200 of that is their profit. So their high priced model has given them a very high profit margin. 20% of every dollar roughly is profit to Apple. Well, let me flip. Let's go to a low profit uh, example of Walmart. You've all, you probably have all been to Walmart. Walmart, as you know, always low prices. <laughs> uh, prices are falling, you know, as soon as you get into Walmart, it's like chicken little for prices. Prices are falling, prices are falling. Um, but nonetheless, they have decided that low prices is really what they have to offer. And so you gotta think about it this way. Low prices at Walmart means that they're collecting less revenue per item, 
you're collecting less revenue per item than a store like uh, than a company like Apple. So for every dollar you're giving Walmart, believe it or not, roughly about 97 cents of that dollar is covering the expenses. And only about three cents of that dollar is a profit for Walmart. Um, this was last year's numbers. And so basically speaking, that's a lot of expenses. And you would say, well, why would Walmart do that? You know, well, because three cents out of every dollar, is it worth it? Well, it's worth it because Walmart has $500 billion in sales revenue. 500 billion, that's a half a trillion dollars. So that's a lot of pennies on every dollar that add up. Um, so they do have a, a good profit, uh, but it certainly can be better. So it's really important. Marketing has a key role in making this thing work. Management is using the exact same information to make decisions. Uh, management is looking at, uh, in this case, product lines or stores. Let's take a look at what's going on now. Um, since uh, online has online uh, related retail sales have gone way up, uh, people are not going to stores as much. And so you've had a lot of retailers, even before the crisis, um, need to close down certain stores. How do they decide what stores to close? Why am I closing the Poughkeepsie store and not the store in White Plains? Well, guess what? They're looking at the same financial information. They're looking at, okay, how much does the store sell? What's the revenues for that particular store? What is the expenses of that store? How much does it cost me to keep that store open? And is there a profit from that store? Is it something that's going to be sustained? Uh, there's no reason to keep a store open if it's losing money. If, it, if, you, if every time you open the store, it costs you money. There's no reason to keep it open. And managers need to use the financial information to make those decisions. And so managers are looking at the financial information saying, well, this store hasn't been profitable for a while. Let's close it down. They do the same thing for product lines. Um, they decide what product lines are worth keeping, what product lines are worth uh, eliminating. And again, it's going to be the financial information that's going to drive most of their decisions. I think it's actually quite funny that the example in this book has a son over a Pepsi can. Um, as you know, soda uh, has been basically on a decline. Soda sales have been on decline for maybe 10, 15 years uh, because of the high sugar content and everyone's watching their weight and doing other types of things. What's really exploded in this period, bottled waters, energy drinks, um, you know, the bottled teas and coffees, uh, specialty drinks like that have really got up. Soda sales have gone way down. So why do we still have Coke? Why do we still have Pepsi? Well, because, uh, of course, it'd be weird to have a company like Coca-Cola who didn't sell Coca-Cola. Um, it's their staple. So what they've done is they decided, look, we're not going to eliminate Coca-Cola. Instead, we're going to take advantage of the situation. Everyone is health conscious. Let's shrink our cans to eight ounces and say these are low-calorie cans. We care about your health. And we show we care about your health because we're not giving you those big ass cans anymore. We're giving you these really teeny tiny cute little cans. They couldn't possibly hurt you. Um, they're only eight ounces and they're less than 100 calories. Go ahead, take it. Uh, and guess what? They're selling more, well, they're selling less Coke, but at a higher price. <laughs> so um, it's working. It's working quite well for the soda companies. And, and so, yes, yeah, soda in big quantities might be dead, but in small, teeny, tiny, cute little cans that wouldn't hurt a butterfly, those are really doing well, really doing well. Okay, human resources also uh, needs <clears throat> uh, to know about financial information because they have to make sure they are hiring and paying people appropriately. Um, they have enough money for benefits and so forth. They're competing for labor with all the other businesses. So they have to make sure that they're paying you uh, and paying people reasonably uh, to keep the talent they need there. And of course, if you're in finance, if you don't know, if you don't know accounting, you're, uh, 
you know, they're a piece of work. Uh, external users in terms of folks that are outside of the company that need financial information. <clears throat> um, let's, uh, let's go to here. Creditors are probably very, very important. A creditor is a lender. Anybody who lends your money is a creditor. Okay, so creditors can be banks for sure, uh, but they can also be suppliers. And of course, uh, investors can be creditors. The bond market is where corporations go to uh, borrow money from investors. So investors then become creditors uh, through, through bonds. And so uh, creditors need to know financial information because creditors are not, lenders are not in the business of lending money and not getting it back. Right. That's not what they want. They want to lend money so they can make money. The whole business model for lending is I lend you money at a high interest rate or as high as I can, and I'm making that money back plus a ton more. So they know what they want to see, and they're not going to give you a loan without knowing you can pay it back. Okay? And so lenders or creditors want financial information. And of course, investors want to know financial information. Is the company profitable? Is it profitable now or will it be profitable very, very soon? Because if I put my, if I purchase shares of ownership stock in this company, I want my money to grow over time. I want to be wealthier in the future than I am right now. And so oftentimes they're looking for companies that are profitable or will be profitable pretty soon. Um, is the company, you know, earning money, sales is going well, they have uh, steady sales or are they in choppy waters, so forth and so on. Investors want to know, and this financial information is available, right, particularly for public corporations, um, so investors can make those decisions better. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to talk about with you is something I can't teach you. I can't teach you ethics. Everyone has learned uh, ethics by now. You've learned it when you were very young, the difference between uh, right and wrong, something doing something good versus doing something bad. Everyone has this education down. You've learned it at home. You've learned it at school. You've learned it uh, in any religious organizations you've gone through or every civil organizations, like if you were in the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, they all have their code of ethics. They all, uh, they all teach, uh, in essence, good behavior versus bad behavior. Well, everyone has this training, but yet some folks end up in business and decide, uh, we're gonna go ahead and lie anyway. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and take stuff that isn't ours anyway, right? They're gonna behave uh, in a way that's the opposite of what they learned even back in kindergarten. Um, so financial scandals uh, that we've had in this country have basically been about lying about financial information, right? Uh, we call that fraud. When you lie about something, that's fraud. So these are basically, scandals are based on fraud. People who have lied, um, companies, corporations that have lied about their financial situation and later have paid that price. Um, well, that's tough to do in a capitalist society. We rely on the stock market and the bond market to raise money for productive purposes, uh, productive business purposes, overwhelmingly. And so imagine if investors cannot trust the numbers that they're looking at. How would anyone want to invest if all the numbers were fake? So uh, Congress, uh, in, their, in their wisdom, and they don't have a lot of it, um, but Congress actually acted. It's hard for Congress to act. Um, there usually has to be a pretty big crisis before Congress actually does something. Um, and so they acted by, oh, I just heard something crash. I hope everyone's okay. Um, and so Congress passed uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which uh, basically um, is a law that for the very first time, corporate executives and uh, boards of direct, certain members of the board of directors need to sign off on the financial information of the company as true and accurate to, their, to the best of their knowledge. Or for the very first time, they could go to jail. Uh, there's actual penalties for lying on financial information. 
And so um, we have to learn the hard way. Enron, Worldcom, uh, Health South AIG, these are just examples of companies who basically lied about their financial situation. And it cost the entire company. These companies don't exist anymore. I mean, Health South does. AIG does in a very different form. But most of these companies don't exist anymore because they basically lied. So Congress now, you know, actually did something very positive. This was back in 2001, 2002, um, when this uh, was passed. But it's been, it's been very good. It's been very good. Okay. And every, uh, every objective ends with a do-it exercise that actually has a solution. So a do-it exercise looks like an, it's an example of um, a homework question with the solution next to it. So I need you to study that as well because they're all, uh, they're all quite good. Okay, so that basically, we'll stop our recording here.